Hi, hello, welcome to a physionics detailed study analysis. Today we're going to be going over uh, some pretty in-depth knowledge on the relationship between obesity and hypertension or high blood pressure. And then uh, for my full version of this video, I'll also be going over diabetes and its relationship to hypertension. So we're going to go into some different physiological mechanisms of how these three essentially relate to one another. So if you're interested in that, then stick around for a lengthy breakdown of the science. Uh, if you're not familiar with who I am, my name is Nicholas Verhoeven. I'm a PhD candidate in molecular medicine. I hold my master's in exercise physiology and I do this for a living. This is my passion. I love reading medical literature, medical science, medical studies, and breaking them down so that they're more understandable for you. But enough about that. Let's go ahead and jump right into the subject at hand. So what are we going to be covering? Well, we're going to be covering, as I mentioned, the relationship between obesity and hypertension. And I'm also going to go over a few of the nutrition solutions that are offered by this scientific review. And I'll show you the the picture of the scientific review in just a, just a minute. And then for anybody that's part of my insiders, my physionic insiders, uh, you also get access to all these other topics as well. So looking at the relationship between diabetes and hypertension, as well some really unique things about women and hypertension, the relation, the protective effect of estrogen and sometimes how that backfires on women. Uh, so that's, that's got some really interesting aspects as well. And then I'm going to touch on fructose, uric acid, and their relationship to hypertension, as well as non-nutrition therapies for combating uh, hypertension. So this is going to be solely nutrition, and this is going to be based on some like drug therapies that uh, if you're interested or if your doctors talk to you about different drug therapies, then uh, that's, that's something to look out for. If you're interested in the full... Uh, study analysis, then you can hop on over to my Physionic Insiders community and you'll get access to this as well as all my other study analyses and many, many more benefits. But let's move on with the first two topics. So this information is going to be coming to us from this scientific review, so the pathophysiology of hypertension in patients with obesity, and then they do touch on some of the mechanisms on diabetes. Now, certainly this is not going to cover everything that you have to know about obesity in the relationship, but it does create a pretty good framework. And I'm going to go into some pretty good detail on at least the physiology. We're not going to go as much into the subcellular mechanisms. I'll touch on it a little bit, but uh, it's going to be mostly uh, with inter-organ and inter-cell communication. Um, and as I do with now that I've started uh, mentioning, so trying to be more transparent and whatnot with the authors of these papers, I looked at the funding for this review and these authors, these two authors were completely funded by public funding, uh, talking about uh, NIH, so government funding and uh, nonprofit funding. And this author also had public funding, but also on top of that was uh, being paid by a by industry funding. I forgot the exact name of the industry funding, but you can easily find it. So just full, full disclosure, I don't think you'll find anything in this information that you'll be thinking, oh, well, clearly this is biased towards, uh, towards drug therapies or anything like that. But still something, uh, something to keep in mind. Okay, with that said, let's dive into this. Let me remove myself because this is a pretty busy slide. This is a slide that I actually took from uh, one of my seminars that I gave for my physionic community, uh, my physionic insiders community, where I essentially describe how we develop blood pressure. So how do, how do we actually control blood pressure? Well, one of the main things that people don't realize is that it has very little to do with your heart has very little to do with your vasculature, which is where the blood pressure is actually generated. And it has so much to do with the, the intercommunication between multiple different organ systems. So we're talking about the liver, we're talking about the kidneys, the lungs, the adrenal glands. And the most important is gonna be the kidneys, and you'll see why in just a second. So 
how does blood pressure actually get created? Well, it gets created by the release from the liver of this molecule known as angiotensinogen. And angi angiotensinogen is then acted on by an enzyme produced in the kidneys called renin or renin, however you want to pronounce it, which then converts this angiotensinogen to angiotensin 1. So angiotensin 1 is then converted to angiotensin 2, and this is going to be a really important molecule, so keep this one in mind, by an enzyme called ACE, or angiotensin converting enzyme. And this ACE enzyme converts to angiotensin 2. Now angiotensin 2 has two different functions, or two primary functions, I should say. I never want to limit a molecule to just two functions because, let's be real, these molecules have wide-reaching effects across the body. So angiotensin 2 can bind to the vasculature, so the actual blood vessels themselves, and cause some certain uh, effects that we'll go into a little bit later. And it can also bind to the adrenals. And the adrenals, which usually sit on top of the kidneys, but I separated them out here, the adrenals then produce aldosterone. And this aldosterone will then feed back, usually they'd be a lot closer, but aldosterone will then feed back onto the kidneys, and then the kidneys do something. And that something is what we're interested in, because that something means that then we have this increase or decrease in blood pressure. So angiotensin II, just to go back to this, has independent effects as well as dependent effects, where deep, dependently affects aldosterone, which then affects the kidneys. So what happens in the kidneys? Well, once aldosterone binds, and you can see that the adrenals are sitting on top of the, uh, the kidneys here, that once aldosterone feedbacks onto the kidney, if we were to slice a kidney open, this is what we would find. We'd find a blood supply, and then we have this, uh, this really complex structure. And this structure, if you zoom into it, is uh, this, which is called a nephron. And this nephron is essentially the exchange. It's a filtration system. It exchanges uh, sodium and, and blood and water and, and other nutrients and things of that nature to filtrate them through before they turn into urine. So they can be reabsorbed into the bloodstream or be released out of the bloodstream to be dumped into the, to the urine. We're not going to go through all this, uh, all, through this entire system, but what I did want to mention is that the kidneys control blood pressure through aldosterone by increasing sodium up uptake. So this increase in the sodium uptake, which happens in the proximal convoluted tubule, which is right around here, allows more sodium to end up in the bloodstream. And then as sodium ends up in the bloodstream, water follows that. So then you have more water and more sodium in the blood in a confined space. So then the, the, the vessel, let's go back here, this vessel has only a, a finite amount of space. So if you continuously dump more volume in that space, just like in anything, if you increase volume in a limited space, pressure increases. What is that pressure? Blood pressure. So that's how this mechanism works, that we get this reuptake of sodium and then the increase in blood pressure. So how is that problematic? How does that tie into obesity? Well, with obesity, we have increases in body fat mass, and it turns out that our body fat is not inert. It doesn't just sit around and do nothing. Uh, it actually has a number of different effects. And some of them can be good effects, as in the release of particular adipokines like adiponectin, which can increase insulin sensitivity if you have lower body fat. However, on the other hand, if you are over fat, as one might be in obesity, then you have these blood pressure specific effects, which are really, really fascinating. So we've got this exact same system here, but I've added body fat here and I've added body fat here. And what are these areas of body fat actually doing? Well, the body fat here is releasing angiotensinogen, which then if you increase the concentration of angiotensinogen and you have sufficient renin, then you'll get more of this angiotensin 1. So the drive towards, towards increasing the precursors for, for increased blood pressure is elevated at the front, at the very beginning of this entire axis, this entire system. And then on the near the back end, we also have that fat tissue, fat cells, adipocytes, can release 
aldosterone stimulating factor so it can bypass all these other systems and can release different molecules that will bind to the adrenal glands which will then promote the release of aldosterone independent of everything else another thing is that they can also release aldosterone although that's a less common mechanism we usually think of it as this release of this aldosterone stimulating factor and if I remember correctly, which don't quote me on this, I'll correct myself uh, in an amendment if this isn't correct, but I believe they can also release angiotensin II specifically. So, and as we know, angiotensin II has specific effects on the vasculature independent of everything else. So there's a lot of different mechanisms by which body fat and having more of these adipocytes means that you're going to most likely have greater expression of this angiotensinogen, aldosterone, angiotensin II, aldosterone stimulating factor, et cetera, et cetera. So there's a lot of effects. Okay, so this is what's called as the RAS or the renin ang angiotensin uh, aldosterone system. And that's just this complex system, this physiological system communicating back and forth one, with one another. But it's not just that. I can now move myself here so you can actually see me if you care or not. But there's also SNS overactivation. I'm looking at my notes over on my left side. So SNS overactivation is sympathetic nervous system activation. What does that mean? Well, your nervous system, if we were to really basically break it down, you would think of your nervous system as having a parasympathetic system and a sympathetic system. And it always confused me when I was just learning about this stuff in like high school and kind of early days in college. You know, and why would they call it parasympathetic and sympathetic? And I always got it confused because I always thought to myself, sympathetic, that seems, oh, like, oh, it cares about you, you know? So it's not going to, it's not going to, make you be hyperactive because it doesn't want to stress you out. That's what I thought. Uh, it's the exact opposite. So sympathetic activation is a more active Im uh, nervous system. I almost said immune system, nervous system. So it's activating every other organ system to be hyperactive. And that's a really general description, but we don't have time to go into all the specifics of exactly how. But one way that it does that is it affects, so here we've got our neuron that is part of our nervous system, and if it's increased its sympathetic activation, then it releases certain molecules. Like one of those molecules would be, you, you might see increases in epinephrine, which would be kind of a global effect, but you also see norepinephrine. So norepinephrine can be released. So if we were to zoom into this axon, which are the axon terminal, which is just the end of this neuron. So here's the beginning of the neuron. This is the, the dendrites, the soma, the axon hillock, and then you've got this axon all the way down here. The signal comes from here and comes all the way down here. And then it affects the uh, axon terminal. And the, at the axon terminal, then you get this release of norepinephrine. And this norepinephrine molecule will bind to all these different tissue systems. And it's not just limited to these, but these are some of the most prevalent in our discussion here. And in obesity, you have much higher levels of this SNS activity so that you have more of this norepinephrine release, which can affect, for example, the kidneys. If we go back here real quick, it can affect this uh, uptake of sodium, as in it can promote the uptake of sodium, which then of course increases blood pressure. Another thing that it does is, is it affects uh, v the vasculature. So it goes to here and it will bind to this vasculature and actually constrict it. And therefore now, even if we were to maintain the volume, let's say, let's say we didn't increase the volume in that, in that vasculature, if we then close the vasculature so it's a smaller space to fit the same amount of volume, what happens? An increase in blood pressure. But we have a dual effect because we not only see increases in blood volume, we also see decreases in the area or the actual space that that volume can can take up. So this also increases blood pressure and it has wide reaching effects, not just on those two mechanisms, but across the entire body that you have greater constriction and activation. And one last thing on this, I also wanted to mention that if 
I, I released a little riddle on my physionic community where I asked people, what would happen if you were to cut the nerve that connects to or communicates with the kidneys? And the answer was that if you think of the nerve actually creating sympathetic drive then and increasing sodium uptake, then that means it would do the opposite. So now you no longer have that promotion of that, that sympathetic drive. And therefore, you see this, this release of sodium. So you're dumping sodium as opposed to keeping sodium and therefore blood pressure then drops. So people, they've done experiments on animals where if they cut the nerve and these animals have high blood pressure, then the nerve being cut then reduces their blood pressure. Not that I, of course, recommend that, <laughs> but it's just kind of a cool aside. So it, it creates this link between, between the two. Okay, another one is vascular injury. So what can also happen is, so here we've zoomed into a vasculature. Let me quick go back here. This is what we're talking about here. Here it's straight, here it's bent. And this vasculature is made up of a number of different cells that actually give it the structure that it has. Think of it like a tube, but think of it as an alive tube, a tube that can change its shape the way that it needs to, to, uh, to accommodate this blood flow that's coming in, let's say from left to right. So blood flow is constantly flowing as your heart is pumping and your muscles are pumping. It's pumping this blood uh, from one area to the, to the other. And the cells that line the inside of this tube, this blood vessel, have particular purposes in that they regulate and, and kind of sense the, the flow of blood. Is there a tremendous flow of blood? Is there a, uh, is there a turbulent flow? Because the type of flow also matters. So if you've got a linear flow, that's much better than a turbulent flow because a turbulent flow will drag on these cells and these cells have to react in certain ways so but if that happens too often or if you have certain effects like and we're going to get into immunity but how inflammation can affect these cells if you have too much damage that occurs to these cells then you can have less reactivity of these cells so these cells are called endothelial cells these endothelial cells are just a single line of cells that line your vasculature and when they're happy, when they're, they're working efficiently, let's say you exercise a lot and you take care of your heart, uh, then in that situation, your endothelial cells are rather ad adept at releasing a molecule known as nitric oxide. It's just one, one example, but it's one of the primary examples, this release of this nitric oxide that I have right here. Nitric oxide can be released, which then it tells the smooth muscles, which are behind these uh, endothelial cells, and those smooth muscles are the ones that actually uh, in, enlarge the blood vessel or constrict the blood vessel, so vasodilation or vasoconstriction. And this nitric oxide, when it binds to these smooth muscles, then they... they not that they think that to themselves, but there's a chemical process that happens within them that then allows for the vasodilation, the opening of that blood vessel. And when that happens, then, as I mentioned, you have the same amount of volume, you have the opening of the blood vessel, which means that it's still a closed system, so you're not bleeding out or anything, it's just uh, widening. That means that your blood pressure then drops. And Unfortunately, with vascular injury, which can come from a series of different uh, factors, but one of the main ones is inflammation, as we'll, we'll get into, it decreases the amount of nitric oxide that's produced by these endothelial cells, and it has a cyclical nature in that you also see the increases in the release of reactive oxygen species, which are molecules that are unsatisfied. Uh, they have an a, a lack of an electron and therefore they start looking or scavenging for electrons from other molecules and they'll rip electrons away from other molecules and in doing so they may satisfy themselves but that creates more reactive oxygen species or they may not satisfy themselves and then you have just more reactive oxygen species in general so there's this this switch from less nitric oxide towards producing more well, from more nitric oxide, I suppose I should say, so producing more reactive oxygen species and less nitric oxide. So this not only 
is caused by the damage of this vascular injury that occurs with obesity at quite a high rate, but you also see an added effect of more damage that these cells cause to themselves and surrounding cells and neighboring cells by the production of reactive oxygen species. So this leads to less of this uh, vasculature able to modulate its uh, size or its opening or its closing. And that ultimately leads to more vascular injury and higher blood pressure. Now, another thing that the, re the researchers of this review mentioned is something known as a desensitization of diuresis. So desensitized pressure diuresis. So what does that mean? Diuresis is essentially just the release of urine. So the the promotion of the release of urine. As, as I mentioned, this is a filtration system that takes out or puts in particular uh, electrolytes, uh, other molecules, whatever it might be, and then you get this release in the urine. So it's one way that your body can detoxify. It can release the things that it no longer needs or that it's trying to get rid of in general because they would be detrimental if they stayed around. And one of the areas is obviously this proximal tubule where we talked about how there was the reuptake of sodium and then the increase in blood pressure. However, what can also happen is that you get a desensitization of this diuresis, which means that there's an imbalance because there has to be a certain amount of pressure within this tubule, within this, uh, this nephron, and there has to be a certain amount of pressure in the blood. And there's these sensory mechanisms that make sure that the pressure in one is at a certain level relative to the other. And if there's a, 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 a dysfunct, a, a problem with the measurement of that pressure, a biological measurement of that pressure, then you can get uh, aberrant behavior where you have, uh, in this case, with the desensitized pressure of this diuresis, that means that you may have more pressure in the nephron, which then pushes more of that water into the bloodstream, which then increases the blood pressure in the bloodstream. So it's not just about blood pressure, it's also a factor of the pressure that's actually found in the nephron and the relationship between the two. I realize I'm doing a bit of a poor job of explaining this, but it's a complicated mechanism and without going into like serious detail of exactly how it functions, which is something that I need to educate myself further on as well, there's still, there's just, just know that there's this relationship between not just looking at blood pressure, but also looking at the pressure in the, the organ systems themselves. And this one in particular, because that, this is the one that actually modulates where the water goes, where the sodium goes. And some of that is based on pressure gradients. So not just based on uh, cellular mechanisms that just tell or pump the, the, the sodium out or pump the water out. It's also based off of uh, pressure gradients. And if you have an imbalance in that, you can also lead to a higher set point where the body doesn't react to anything unless it reaches that particular set point. So it may maintain a high blood pressure perpetually because it sees that as, uh, think of kind of like the body weight set point that people sometimes mention. Well, you have other set points that also are homeostatic that stay within your body. So this is another way that obesity seems to reset that set point to a higher set point. And next I wanted to discuss uh, inflammation. So one of the areas, so we're going to break this down individually, one of the areas is through these cells, which are technically macrophages. They should be monocytes, but uh, hopefully you won't dig me for, for my image uh, creation skills. But these immune cells, these innate immune cells, will infiltrate more into the vasculature. So remember when we talked about these cells? Well, behind them, that there, there's these smooth muscles, and then there's uh, other layers that go beyond them as well. And these immune cells, what they do is, if they're triggered to a site of vascular injury, as one example, then they can be activated. They can become more of an M1 phenotype, which means that immune cells, if we're, we're talking about this really basically because I realize that there's going to be some immunologists that are going to be like, 
this is such a basic explanation, uh, which I totally acknowledge. I totally acknowledge. I realize that there's a gradation of the activation of immune cells. So the, the initial idea was that you have M2 and M1 macrophages, if we're just focusing on one type of cell, one type of innate immune cell. These macrophages can be activated if, and then they're M1, or they can be in a more quiescent state, as in they are not as active in their M2 state. Now, technically, the new paradigm is that now we've come to research that it's really more of a gradation. And that tends to happen across all biology, that it tends to be more of a gradation. But let's just look at it from those two extremes, inact inactive and active. So in obesity, you have higher levels of activity of the immune cells. So just general activity of the immune cells. And that may be partly because you have this, this vascular injury that's constantly occurring. So the immune cells are drawn to that area to help in the repair process or to help deal with uh, debris or whatever might occur in that area or the damage that's caused by the reactive oxygen species. So these immune cells will often find themselves infiltrating or invading into the endothelial layer, meaning that they push themselves between these cells and push themselves beyond these cells. And this can lead to foam cells, uh, which are cells that end up ultimately getting stuck in that area. And then you start producing this atherosclerotic plaque, plock. It's not even a word, uh, plaque which then ends up pushing this endothelial layer outwards and outwards and outwards until you have this thrombus that eventually forms. And then you get where I'm going with this. There's this atherosclerotic plaque, which then reduces the volume or the amount of space that you have for this liquid, this uh, volume to go through, and therefore you get increases in blood pressure that are specific to this particular area. Now, of course, if something breaks off of that and then gets stuck downstream, then you can have some serious problems as well. So this is just a, that's one of the ideas and one of the prevailing ideas as to why we get atherogenesis or the buildup build of plaque. And that's because we have more of these activated immune cells which infiltrate into uh, this area, infiltrate beyond the endothelial cells in an attempt to help. It's not like these cells are thinking, oh, I can't wait to give Nick some atherogenesis. Uh, they're, just, they're just doing their job. They're reacting to chemical stimuli like heightened reactive oxygen species or pro-inflammatory molecules that may be released by the endothelial cells. Now, we can look at it from another perspective here. So this is the, the lengthwise view. Now, if we were to look down the tube, so we're looking at the lengthwise view of the, the hose of the uh, vasculature. And then if we turn it and look down like a, like a telescope, then we would see this. And here we've got our endothelial cells. Technically, there's more uh, layers to this, but we've got our single layer of endothelial cells that I mentioned earlier. And these immune cells will then invade past them and start to create, create havoc because they also end up releasing more reactive oxygen species as well as more pro-inflammatory molecules like uh, cytokines, like pro-inflammatory cytokines like uh, tumor necrosis factor or alpha or uh, interleukin-6 are two prime examples. Now, another area is in the kidneys or just in tissues in general, but since we're so focused on blood pressure, with obesity, we also see increases in general immune cells. I used a macrophage again, but it doesn't necessarily have to be a macrophage. It can also be uh, an adaptive uh, immune system. So these are innate, so as in they're always around. Um, and then you have adaptive immunity, which is the more reactive immunity, and it tends to be hyper-specific, tends to be extremely lethal. Uh, to, to bacteria or viruses that it ends up encountering. But if that, if that type of immune system is activated, then you get more of the production of things like T cells. And these T cells or thymus cells can invade into the, the kidneys and can also lead to the pro-inflammatory state of the kidneys. So you can imagine, let's go cut to here. They, they would invade into this area 
and start to do damage to all these nephrons, start doing damage to all these systems. And remember, these systems are finely tuned to work as optimally as they possibly can. And once they have to start dealing with damage from more reactive oxygen species, they have to repair that damage. It becomes, it becomes think of it kind of like a war zone. It just happens uh, in that area. So these T cells can also uh, cause this effect. So you get T cell infiltration in the kidneys and the vasculature, and then you also get fewer of the regulatory cells, which are known as T regulatory cells, which are T cells that regulate other T cells. They regulate the adaptive immune system and they try to reduce inflammation. They try to bring down the activity of that system. So if you have reduced levels of that and you have more activation of these pro-inflammatory uh, cells, then you're getting mass release of pro-inflammatory uh, molecules you're getting more damage that's occurring. And again, I don't want you to think that your immune system is trying to hurt you. It's just reacting to what's right there. And obesity just has this, this overarching effect where it constantly leads to more injury of all these different systems, which then the immune system then responds to. And now the last one that I wanted to discuss, and keep in mind, again, this is not all encompassing or anything like that, but another area is to look at, uh, at uh, the microbiome. So uh, here I've got an example of a healthier microbiome, and the definition for healthier is still under scrutiny because microbiome research is really just at its infancy at this point, but it's growing quite quickly, uh, which is really fantastic, and I, I plan on releasing a lot more content on that. But if you've got a quote unquote healthy microbiome and we've determined certain things that are healthier and versus non-healthy, or at least associations. And what we find is that a healthier microbiome inhibits hypertension and a less healthy microbiome in the gut uh, leads to greater levels of hypertension. And one of the mechanisms, and again, just to repeat, little is known, but this is one of the mechanisms that has been identified, is that with an unhealthy microbiome, or uh, the microbiome is these bacteria and microbes that are found in your intestines, with an unhealthy level of these bacteria, they can lead to the release of more of a molecule known as liposaccharide, which is LPS for short. LPS will then, if it ends up in your bloodstream, that's a really bad thing. You don't want LPS in your bloodstream because it is a bacteria-specific molecule and it will absolutely make your immune system go haywire, uh, as in just full alert, uh, mass attack on whatever is causing this liposaccharide release. And so one of the, the indirect effects that microbiome, the microbi an unhealthy microbiome can have is this release of the liposaccharides, which then activates the immune system. And as I mentioned, the immune system has all these negative effects, uh, not on purpose, again. Another one is by the reduced production of helpful molecules by the microbiome like butyrate or short chain fatty acids, which also affect insulin sensitivity, but they can also affect uh, hypertension by affecting the vasculature. Um, again, a lot of this stuff, it's tough for me to go into any serious detail on because uh, researchers just don't know the answer yet. We're still figuring this stuff out, but we do know that there is an association between a healthy microbiome and hypertension or reduced hypertension. And with obesity and overconsumption as a whole, we tend to see strong shifts toward an unhealthy microbiome, releasing more of these liposaccharides and therefore also contributing to increases in hypertension. Okay, well, let's look at some uh, possible remedies. And this is not going to be just this like unbelievable information or anything. There's going to be some useful nuggets, but keep in mind, these researchers aren't nutritionists. They're not uh, dietitians or anything like that. They just have a cursory glance and mention a few studies that indicate uh, certain helpful benefits. So one of them is the omega-3 to omega-6 ratio. You may already know this, but the omega-6 amount that we consume is way higher, like 10 times, 10 fold or even higher levels of omega-6 is what we're exposed to. 
and we don't consume sufficient amounts of omega-3. So researchers have thought that maybe it's the relationship between omega-3 and omega-6s, and if we can up or either decrease omega-6s, but generally they try to increase omega-3s because of the specific effects that omega-3s have, then you'll see improvements in hypertension. You'll see reduced blood pressure. Now, one of the drawbacks of this is that, uh, at least at the time of this uh, review release, there hasn't been strong evidence that it's actually decreased cardiovascular events, if I remember correctly from what they mentioned. So this is something that's still being investigated, but overall, what I do know is that omega-3s, in general, improve health across a multitude of metrics. Even if they don't necessarily help against cardiovascular disease, they may help in other areas. So it's not like uh, you're, you're taking a risk by consuming omega-3s, at least not generally. And what the researchers mention is that with an increase in omega-3 consumption, then you have, there's an association with slight reduction in blood pressure. So is it going to be a huge effect? Maybe not, but at least it's some effect. Um, where you would get omega-3s, you could get it from fish oil, krill oil, you can get it from uh, other like synthetic forms. You can also get it from uh, eating fish, and that's all the ones I can rattle off the top of my head. Another one is probably not a huge shock to a lot of you is eating more vegetables and fruits, specifically vegetables, um, moderating your sodium intake, especially if you're a sodium sensitive versus insensitive individual. Um, sodium sensitive individuals definitely need to take this into consideration. I actually uh, talked about this in an office hours episode with my physionic insiders where I did a uh, kind of not a full deep dive, but a mini deep dive into sodium sensitive individuals and sodium insensitive individuals and the effects on blood pressure, hypertension, cardiovascular disease, heart disease, things of that nature. But the bottom line is moderating sodium. And I will say that it seemed like, at least by my initial estimate, which may change in the future, uh, that low sodium is probably unrealistic. So like something like uh, 2.3 grams, I think, is the, the, the current recommendation. So 2.3 grams may be too low, but slightly higher than that is probably okay and probably beneficial. But going too high can also be uh, detrimental. Um, and of course, like, uh, this is pretty basic advice. Like, just have a healthy diet. And keep in mind, again, these researchers aren't dietitians. They're not nutritionists. They're just cell biologists, physiologists. They're just kind of giving uh, information on general information on how to improve. So this could be replaced with a moderate, uh, moderate nu nutrient, uh, healthy diet, and then just moderating your sodium. This next one is a little bit unique uh, because I've never really discussed it. Is also the consumption of nitrates, and they specifically mention beetroot juice is a good source of these nitrates. And the reason why you'd want these nitrates is because they're precursors to the nitric oxide that I mentioned earlier. So right here, so this molecule. So you can then influence your endothelial cells to produce more of this nitric oxide, which would combat some of the effects of reactive oxygen species. So they mentioned that nitrates are something to potentially look into as well. Okay, so here are the midpoint conclusions. So hypertension manifests in obesity through a, a bunch of different actions, as we talked about, uh, through impaired kidney regulation, but also damage to the kidneys, increased vascular injury, we definitely talked about that at length, greater sympathetic nervous system activity, inflammation, if that's adaptive or from the innate immune system. And that was just a few of them, and some of them weren't even mentioned uh, in this review. So there's just a lot of ways that obesity affects, uh, high, or hypertension has a relationship to ob obesity. The next topics, or some of the next topics, are going to be talking about uh, diabetes and hypertension. So looking at all this, but in, uh, specifically towards diabetes. Uh, women in hypertension, fructose and uric acid, and different drug therapies that have also been invented that help uh, fight some of these problems. So if you're interested in that, then just hop on over to my Physionic Insiders and you'll get access to this full 
version as well as uh, all the other content that I have in there from seminars, office hours, everything else that I've mentioned throughout the presentation. And uh, if not, then I'll hope to have the pleasure of speaking with you in the near future. Have a good one. Bye.